I'm going to ask you to turn to two places as we get started. First of all, Leviticus chapter 14, back in the Old Testament, Leviticus 14, and also Mark chapter 1. I'll give you a moment to find both of those places, Leviticus 14 and Mark chapter 1. Leviticus 14, let's begin there. It's begin, uh, beginning at the very first verse. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper, then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean, and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop, and the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, and the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. Now run forward to the book of Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And let's begin there at verse 40. 40 down through verse 44. Mark 1 verses 40 to 44. And there came a leper to him, meaning Christ, beseeching him and kneeling down to him and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him, and saith unto him, I will, be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away. And saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. I'm going to stop reading right there just for a moment. And uh, this morning, I'm going, to, I'm going to need you to turn to quite a lot of scripture with me. I don't normally do that. Normally, in our service, our, our, our church service hour, I don't have you turn quite a bit because I want to focus your attention on what I want to say. In our Bible lessons, we certainly turn to a lot of scripture. Uh, so I'm making an exception today because I think it's uh, essential and I think it's all pertinent and relevant. And so do your best to follow along as I give you the references. If you're watching by the internet, write the scriptures down. Don't just sit there in your pajamas watching and not doing anything. Get yourself a copy of the Bible and, and follow along with us. Follow along with us or write the references down if you don't have time to turn quickly enough and look at them later. And I believe it'll be very instructive to you. These two texts give the instructions for one who is cleansed of his leprosy, and also the fact that the Lord Jesus recognized the role of the priest in either to confirm or deny the man's healing. Christ told the man to go show himself to the priest and let the priest prescribe the uh, appropriate sacrifices for such a case. Our Savior, who could heal with uh, just a touch or a word, still uh, acknowledged the ministry of the Levitical priesthood to recognize and confirm God's miracles. He said in Matthew 5, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. And I mentioned the subject of the priesthood because right now there is a crisis facing the Roman Catholic Church. And they need our help. They have a shrinking number of Catholic priests to serve their members worldwide. Since World War II, the number of Roman Catholics uh, in the church has grown tremendously, but the number of priests available has not kept up. In 1970, the total number of Catholics worldwide was 653 million. Since 2012, it's 
stands at right about 1.2 billion members worldwide. The number of priests, however, has decreased. It was 420,000 priests around the world in 1970. It, is, it decreased down to about 419,000 around the world by 2012. The ratio of priests to church members was one priest for every 800 church members in 1970 here in the United States. It currently stands at one priest for about every 2,500 church members in America. In Mexico, the statistics is even worse. A country that's 85% Roman Catholic nevertheless has a ratio of one priest for every 7,000 Roman Catholics. A, very, a fewer young men are wanting to enter the Roman Catholic priesthood. These statistics, to me, are unacceptable. <laughs> Something needs to be done. Yeah. Now listen, when we bring up the subject of Roman Catholicism and some of their doctrines, or some of the practices and some of the crazy ideas that certain Catholic people have adopted, um, you know, I saw an image of Jesus in a water stain on the shower curtain. I mean, and so they make an, a, a, a shrine out of that. Well, there are just as many crazy things going on with non-Catholic people, too. You know, if you think Oral Roberts could sneeze on a napkin and mail it out to you and you get a blessing by putting on your body and get healing, you were, an, you were, you deserve to have your money taken from you. If you think Benny Hinn can blow into the microphone and the Holy Spirit knocks 50 people down in the front row, you, you are a sucker. P.T. Barnum says, one of you born every minute. So we're not singling them out for certain things, but we, are, we, we do desire to compare the scriptures with what people are taught to believe or what they think is right or the practices that they believe are right, which may not be biblical at all. And so it's not out of uh, malice or any animosity. It's out of concern, truth, truthfully, that I bring this subject up. But being the uh, magnanimous and, and charitable guy that I am, and uh, knowing how much all of you care, if you want to write a title down for this, you can write this down. It's time to help the Catholic Church. It's time to help the Catholic Church. And like I say, I'm going to need you to turn to a lot of scripture with me today. Now, if someone doesn't want your help, that's a different matter. That, that's between them and God, and that's their business. But let me offer at least three suggestions that would help increase the number of priests worldwide. First of all, write this down. The fitness of the priesthood needs to be expanded. I'll try to explain what I mean. Run back, if you will, to Leviticus 21. Leviticus 21 and begin there at verse 16. Leviticus 21, begin at verse 16. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations, that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach. A blind man or a lame, or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken-footed, or broken-handed, or crook-back, or a dwarf, or that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy. Scurvy was some disease that showed a lot of lividity or liver spots in the skin, and sometimes wide lips and swollen gums were also a symptom of scurvy. It even sounds nasty, scurvy, you know. Or scabbed, or half his stones broken. That would be an injury even to your private parts. Verse 21, No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest, shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish. He shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. Right now, only males are allowed to be part of the Catholic priesthood. And even... And there are even physical uh, restrictions on them. 
some handicap, some uh, deformity may disqualify a young man from becoming a priest. Back in the 1960s, there were a lot of children born and they, they, the best that researchers could determine was that some drug or chemical their mother had been taking either before or during her pregnancy caused the babies to be born with severe physical deformities. Um, you'd have a, a fully grown person who had no arms on their body. How many remember seeing people like that? And in some cases, they may had a, a part of an arm or part of a hand on their shoulder, but no arm. And, and you, you can only have a, a pity and some empathy uh, for folks in that condition. I knew and met a young man who was like that. He, had, he was born completely whole, except he had no arms on his body, no arms or hands on his body. He was Catholic, and he inquired about becoming a priest, even in his condition. And he was told that he could not because they required someone to at least have the ability to hold up the wine and the wafer to become a priest and doing those duties. So there are restrictions and limitations on the priesthood, even today. In the New Testament, however, here is God to the rescue. In the New Testament, all true Christians are considered priests of the Lord. We refer to this as the priesthood of believers. Now, if the church assumes that all of their members also are believers in Jesus Christ, they could have 1.2 million priests overnight. I want you to run to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to move along for time's sake today. Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19. Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19. The Lord Jesus speaking, and I say unto thee, also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. If Christ gave Simon Peter exclusive authority, this was the place where they say he gave it to him. But look over one page to Matthew 18 and verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In King James English, ye, Y-E, uh, is a reference to an individual, or rather to, to a, a, a plural group, more than one person. The, T-H-E-E, -E, or thou, the, thou, thy, is a reference to an individual, and ye, or you, or your, is a reference to a, a group, more than one person. So it switched quickly in the space of two chapters in Matthew's account from uh, the, Simon Peter, to ye, all the apostles. And the apostles uh, also were given that power. Run to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 19 and 20. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Well, Paul wasn't one of the first twelve apostles, neither were any of his traveling companions, but he says, we beseech you. God hath given unto us the word of reconciliation. Run, if you will, to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Notice what the Apostle John writes. Revelation 1. And there, notice verses 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, notice, and, made, and hath made us kings and priests 
unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All true believers in Christ are part of God's priesthood. He says kings and priests. Christ offered himself as a priest and offered himself as an offering uh, first, and he is going to reign one day as a king. And so your, your uh, life as a follower must follow that pattern. You serve him now as a priest, and you will reign with him as a king one day. Um, now the question naturally would arise in these verses, does that include men and women? See, a lot of women these days, a lot of liberal lesbians, they want to become priests too. They like the, the image of that, that robe or something that sort of confers uh, authority upon them. I've seen some really goofy-looking women ministers among Protestant denominations, and Protestants are no better when it comes to thinking that the robe itself confers authority. You see, when you don't know anything, put on a special costume and make people think you know something. I saw some lady get out of her car with her special robe on, carrying her purse, you know, over to a funeral. It looks so ridiculous. You know, you might, have, might as well have had the man carrying the purse. It, it just looked really crazy. But the priesthood is not limited to just men. It wasn't limited only to Simon Peter, then the other apostles. Paul said, it's us and we, we beseech you, be reconciled to God. So it was not only... It, it was growing quickly, rather quickly, in the early days of the church. And John writes, God hath made us, all of us, kings and priests to God. It means men and women. Go back to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And Galatians 3, verses 26 through 28, if you want to write the reference down. Galatians 3, verses 26 through 28. The Apostle Paul writes, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. Watch it. There is neither male nor female. But ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Um, this makes no distinction for race or gender or someone with a physical limitation. Jew or Greek, Jew or Gentile, male or female, all of you uh, should be able to be a priest of the Lord Jesus Christ and to serve him as his ambassador, seeking to reconcile others to God. But the fitness of the priesthood uh, needs to be expanded. Suggestion number two, the function of the priesthood needs to be redefined. The function and the functions need to be redefined. I realize this sounds like heresy to maybe Roman Catholic authorities. They might not want to embrace the possibility that without the essential um, powers of the priest being executed by a, a duly ordained Catholic priest, then the, the essence of the faith would be lost. However, currently, according to their own statistic, 16 to 17 percent of all parishes worldwide have no resident priests to serve it. And that includes 23 or 3,500 parishes here in the United States alone. The religious uh, ministry is then uh, sustained by the laity, by deacons, by something akin to a circuit riding priest who comes by once a week to have uh, mass and offer services. You know, after the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD and Jews were scattered around the world, the Jews survived and the Jews adapted uh, through a system of synagogues throughout the world and rabbis who are not even from the tribe of Levi. Somehow they are still with us. They've survived. And they still identify as true Jews and descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So redefining the function of the priesthood and its role, its duties, its work, is not uh, unprecedented. The New Testament agrees. Go to the book of Romans, chapter 12. Go 
Romans 12, and notice there verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. No, it's not unreasonable for God to expect you to live a clean and a virtuous life for the honor of Jesus Christ. It's much more effective at bringing other people to Christ than to say, I have special power granted by God, when you're still a jerk. <laughs> Go, if you will, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. Notice what Peter himself writes, verses 13 and 14. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Well, that certainly matches what Paul wrote, uh, admonishing people to, be, to make their entire life a sacrifice to God. Look at chapter 2 and verse 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Peter wasn't the only rock. He says here that all believers are stones that collectively uh, compose the house of God, the church of God, and make up the priesthood. A spiritual house, a spiritual sacrifice. And you might ask, well, sacrifices such as what? Well, I'm glad you asked. Turn back two pages in your Bible, more than likely one or two pages, to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews doesn't mean that only men make the coffee. I had a friend I worked with who was Jehovah Witness, and we were working a funeral service at a church, and they had one of these, you know, coffee carts that they'd roll out during their, their church break time, kind of like they'd have in the malls where the people are selling things. And uh, the title of the, the, the coffee cart was Jehovah Java. He got so offended by that. <laughs> Inside, I was laughing. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> but Hebrews chapter 13, notice verses 15 and 16. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Every true believer, every real Christian, should be able to thank God for something all the time. All the time. I've been sick uh, or dealing with a sickness the last couple of years. And I've had a lot of people say, well, you look great. Well, I know I do. <laughs> but, but when I think about uh, other people in worse shape than I'm in and have far worse medical problems than I have, I have to thank God for problems I don't have. Thank God for the, 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 the strength that enabled you to roll out of bed today, to come over to be here at, uh, at church at this hour, to sit with other Christians and, and hopefully and prayerfully receive something from the Word of God. And uh, that's our desire. So there are plenty of things to thank God for, if you just uh, put your mind to it. To do good means to do good. Paul says in Galatians 6.10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them who are of the household of faith, especially your fellow Christians. You owe a lot to them. But to communicate was a reference to sending money or material help where it would do the most good. Paul commended the Philippians for their giving to help him. Quote, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things 
which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Philippians 4, verse 18. If the priesthood was expanded and the functions and the sacrifices redefined, everyone could participate in the work of being a priest before God. And uh, neither one of those changes uh, blasphemes God in any way. So what, what about all the other things? When a Roman Catholic priest is ordained, he is said to receive uh, three primary powers or gifts. He has the power to change the bread and the wine, the elements of communion, into the actual flesh and blood of the Lord Jesus. Secondly, he has authority to forgive sins through the confessional. And thirdly, he has the authority to preach the gospel in its purity. You really never have too many of your Catholic friends offer you a, a Catholic track or try to invite you to their church or try to talk to you about your salvation with Jesus Christ. That's the job of the priest from the pulpit. It's his job, it's his special prerogative to preach the gospel. Well, the matter of the bread and the wine is a simple matter of misinterpreting the scriptures. John chapter 6 and verse 53, you don't need to turn here, but you can write it down. John 6 verse 53, the Lord Jesus said, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. And verse 55, he says, For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And the person who misinterprets takes it to be absolutely literal. But in the same chapter, just a few verses earlier in John 6, verse 35, the Lord Jesus gives us the context. He says, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. It's a spiritual process. The way you eat and drink Christ's flesh and blood is by coming to him and believing. As a sinner in need of salvation, in need of forgiveness. So it's a simple, that's a simple matter of misinterpreting the, the verses of the Bible. The uh, matter of forgiving sins, you know, binding and loosing. Christ said that in order to prove that he could forgive sins, he would demonstrate his power by healing cripples. Read Matthew chapter 9, Mark chapter 2, about the lame man that they brought, and Jesus said, Thy son, thy sins be forgiven thee. We talked about that last week. And uh, since no man, no earthly man can do that, then the definition of binding and loosing has to be redefined to make it more practical. When you are instrumental in bringing somebody else to Jesus Christ uh, and having them turn over their heart and their soul and their life and give their eternity to God by Jesus Christ, then effectively you loose them from their sins and you confirm their name in heaven as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote, to, Paul wrote For though ye have 10,000 instructors, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15. Which leads me to the third alleged power, preaching the gospel. Only the Catholic priesthood uh, is charged with doing that right now. But if the priesthood was expanded, if the functions of the priesthood were redefined, then all believers could be preachers of the gospel and should be. Turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5, 6, and 7. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Preaching the gospel and winning other souls to Jesus Christ is not for a special class of ministers designated 
solely to do that. It's a team effort. If you offer a track to somebody, you are planting a seed. Or you are watering a seed someone before you planted. And God causes it to take life when he's ready, when the time is right. So not only should the priesthood be expanded to increase its numbers, not only should the function of the priesthood be um, um, redefined to make it more practical, but thirdly and lastly, the focus of the priesthood needs to be on Christ alone. Christ said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 3, verse 14. He said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. John 12, verse 32. And, the, and John the Baptist preached, he must increase, but I must decrease. John 3, verse 30. The Catholic Church and the Catholic priesthood, they like to elevate images and statues of the Virgin Mary and carry her in solemn processions and a lot of festivals. There is an image, uh, supposedly Our Lady of Guadalupe. That's a whole another interesting story in itself, which I won't go into. But they have reproductions of this image of uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe, and it travels the, the route, a circuit, just about every year throughout North America, from parish to parish to parish, so that the faithful can come and look at it and press their rosary beads up against the glass in which it's contained and ask for some, seek some special blessing from the Virgin Mary by that. And uh, not only that, but they elevate the Pope. When you see his procession, when you see his entourage, we see the entire kingdom over which he presides, they elevate the person of the Pope far higher than the Lord Jesus ever received when he was here. And according to an article I found in Encyclopedia Britannica, there are over 10,000 canonized saints recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. 10,000. As if to say, the Lord Jesus can't do all of it. He can't do everything. He needs some help. And he needs help by an ever-growing uh, cadre, an ever-growing uh, assortment of saints there to help. There are saints for architects. There are special uh, patron saints for actors, for cabinet makers, for plumbers, for electricians. There are saints for candle makers. I don't know how busy they are once the light, once the light bulb was invented. There are, there, are, there are patron saints for people who make straw brooms, patron saints for painters, patron saints for florists. There are patron saints for everything. Saint Nicholas, ho, 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 is the patron saint for beer drinkers. Christmas cheer. <laughs> Uh, but with every new, newly canonized saint who's then enlisted into the service of the Catholic faithful, the authority of Jesus Christ is diminished just a little bit more. But since Paul declares that one day every knee is going to bow to the Lord Jesus Christ, Philippians 2.10, then he needs to become the focus of the priesthood, the focus of the church. Now, let me try to finish this. I've only made these things tongue-in-cheek for the purpose of revealing the priesthood of believers. And uh, these are merely suggestions that if someone were to follow, they would have to make an important decision. Do I stay with the church I was raised in or do I seek after God and seek after the truth of God as revealed in his Bible? Since the Catholic priesthood uh, has continued for such a long time without us, and since they've continued for such a long time by ignoring what's written on the pages of the New Testament, it's highly unlikely that they will accept my suggestions today. So we have to say respectfully, as charitably as we can, forget about the Catholic priesthood. Forget about it altogether. If you're a sinner and you're willing to admit to God that you're a sinner, and you say, God, I believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God and the perfect Son of God, and I'm willing to believe He died in my place as my substitute, 
in the best way I know how, I'm asking that you would save my soul by my faith in him. Help me to understand what it is he can do for me. Wash my, wash my soul clean of the sin and the, and the guilt that I carry around with me by the blood of Jesus Christ, by faith. I don't know how else to do it, God. I'm asking for your help. And his righteousness will become yours. Your sins will be put on him. And a great transaction takes place like that between the sinner and the Savior. Only the Savior can save. A church cannot save. A priest cannot save. A saint cannot save. The Virgin Mary cannot save. Only the Savior can save. It should stand to reason. So Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, the Apostle Paul said. And if you're a sinner, God wants to save you. God wants to do something good for you today. And if you're a Christian, you need to be mindful of the lost around you, mindful of how many people are trusting some man-made enterprise to get them to heaven, which it can never do.